Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Ahmed Uzair and I am a part of the FANA board. FANA stands for Fast Alumni Association of North America. And we are here to conduct our fifth session of our recently started uh, webinar series. And this, uh, the today's topic is medical imaging and its practical applications. Uh, our uh, distinguished guest speaker today is Dr. Arish Kazi. Uh, before delving down more into his work and his background, I would quickly like to go over uh, the uh, information about what FANA is and what do we do. Uh, FANA basically uh, was started uh, almost five to seven years ago with the main uh, aim to uh, raise funds for different initiatives on fast campuses or across Pakistan. Uh, but so far our initiatives have fo focused towards two main things which has been scholarship fund and research fund. Under scholarship fund we have been uh, supporting needy students via the campuses uh, and raising funds uh, and collecting funds to, which would eventually go to the campus and then campus would uh, pick uh, the deserving students uh, and uh, help them complete their studies. The second initiative has been on the research side where FANA has been helping the campuses uh, take initiatives that, uh, that encourage students to go towards the R&D uh, and in this, uh, we have also been helping um, various campuses set up uh, R&D labs and, um, and incubation centers. Uh, so far for 2019, our main focus has been the digital engagement via the webinars, which uh, this particular event is part of. Uh, uh, then we have also been involved in enhancing North America alumni membership. Uh, we've been doing a lot of campus outreach activities. Um, we've been involved in updating and streamlining on our digital channels. We have WhatsApp, we have Facebook groups, we have, uh, we have uh, LinkedIn groups. Uh, so all those various channels. And then uh, the financial planning, which is obviously a big part when you're raising funds for uh, various campus activities. Uh, this is a quick snippet of our financials. Uh, uh, we have allocated $52,000 for scholarships at five campuses and five software competitions. Um, uh, for scholarship funding, uh, So for scholarship funding, we have uh, 1,200. Uh, we have 1,200 dollars per student per semester. If somebody wants to uh, donate, uh, and then if somebody wants to sponsor a student for an entire year, it is 2,400 dollars. For the research fund, uh, a software competition can be sponsored for. $1,200 for an entire, uh, looks like, So, uh, sorry for the interruption, but uh, so I was saying about the, uh, so the software competition uh, can be sponsored for $1,200 per event. Lastly, uh, these are uh, our various uh, digital channels that I was mentioning before. Uh, 
uh, we have uh, we have uh, Fast NU Alumni Association, uh, the official website fana.org. We have a WhatsApp group. You can join that WhatsApp group by texting the message to this number, uh, which is plus one two four eight six nine seven six one nine four. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where this uh, this webinar will be posted afterwards. Uh, we have a LinkedIn group. We have a North NU alumni emailing list, and then we have Facebook groups and pages as well. Which, uh, if you have any sorts of question, you can reach out to me uh, later on, and I would be more than happy to uh, talk to you more about them and how to get more engaged. Uh, now going back to our current session um, i would briefly go over uh, what this session is going to be about uh, so our uh, medical imaging has lately revolutionized the clinical decision making uh, magnetic resonance imaging compute tomography and other uh, imaging modalities have enabled clinicians to non-invasively and reliably visualize internal organs and provide important information about the psychological and pathopsychological physiological changes. Uh, to talk more about this, we have our distinguished speaker today, uh, Dr. Arish Kazi, who has more than 15 years of industry experience performing medical imaging analysis and processing research and development, both at private uh, companies as well as in hospital uh, settings. So with that, I would like to pass over the ball to Dr. Kazi. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, here you go, Dr. Kazi. Okay, uh, thank you, Zer. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you and I can see your screen as well. Okay, so um, hello everyone. I welcome, uh, my name is Arish Kazi and I welcome you all um, to this talk. So a bit about me. Um, I have a PhD in, in computer science where the um, majority of the, my research work during my PhD was um, in the field of medical image analysis. I'm currently working as head of R&D at ClaronNav, uh, which is based in Toronto, Canada. Um, Claronav is a company that makes medical devices primarily for uh, image guided surgery. And in the in the past, um, I've worked in in, in different uh, companies, uh, most prominently at uh, Philips Medical Systems. Um, I've been uh, working in this industry for about 15 years. Um, I wrote my first commercially used uh, medical image segmentation algorithm in in 2004. Uh, in this presentation, I'll, I'll focus uh, on primarily focus on how the field of medical image analysis is uh, impacting healthcare uh, by using examples uh, both from my past and my and my current work. Uh, but before we uh, move on, let's look at some background. So imaging has become an essential component of, of medical research. So the goal of uh, medical imaging um, is to facilitate clinical decision making. So let's see how it's done. So this is an uh, image, an MR scan uh, of the brain, uh, which shows a tumor over here. So as you can see in this, in this image that without cutting up, it enables the clinician to non-invasively see the underlying um, anatomy. And uh, the market of medical imaging is gonna shoot up to 49 billion by 2020. Um, and with such a huge market, there is a great, great demand obviously. Um, this all, with, with, you know, with the um, advent of all these um, instrumentation, um, it has led to an immense amount of data generation. So imagine um, a clinician manually segmenting this, this tumor for, uh, for hundreds, uh, 100 patients. It'll take ages. Um, and, and the thing is that this, the amount spent on, on, on contouring or delineating information about the tumor can very well be spent on seeing um, other patients. Uh, now, this is where computer science and, and automation comes in. So uh, we as computer scientists in this field, we develop automated methods that can both qualitatively and quantitatively analyze these medical images. Hence, uh, this field is medical image processing and, and analysis. 
So let's look at, you know, what kind of different imaging techniques that we have uh, available in this, in this field. So it all started uh, with the discovery of, of x-rays. So this guy, Willem Rutkin, um, uh, did his first scan, x-ray scan in 1885. And this is a scan of uh, his wife's hand. This is a typical uh, 21st century um, x-ray image. Now, there are other uh, modalities uh, such as computed um, tomography or, or CT. Now, CT uses the principles of, of x-rays. However, these x-ray measurements are taken from, from different angles, uh, which produces cross-sectional or, or, or 2D um, slices of the scanned object. And then these slices are then processed um, further to generate a 3D volume. So X-ray, uh, regular X-ray uh, results in 2D images, whereas computer tomography images are inherently 3D images. Then we have MRI or magnetic resonance imaging, which is again um, uh, a 3D imaging technique. And MRI, uh, in contrast to CT, is based on the principles of um, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. So what it does is that it measures spatial variations in the phase and frequency of um, RF uh, pulses or, or radio frequency pulses that is emitted and, uh, and absorbed uh, by an object uh, in the presence of an external uh, or uniform magnetic field. This is a, a typical uh, MR scanner. So this board over here uh, houses the, uh, the external magnet and this magnet is actually always on. Then we have ultrasound, uh, which actually uses uh, sound waves. And it's a very uh, common uh, imaging technique um, pr prominently for uh, monitoring fetal growth. Then we have PET and SPECT. PET is positron emission tomography and SPECT is single photon emission computer tomography. They're both based on, on the CT technique. However, uh, they rely um, on a radioactive tracer being injected in the, in the human body. So let's look at some of the images. This is, a, this is an uh, X-ray image of, of the thorax region. This is a CT image of the, of the thorax. And these are um, MR images of the brain. Now, a question that, that you may ask is, uh, you know, why, why so many different imaging techniques? The thing is that they, they provide different kinds of information. So X-ray and, and CT is actually good for showing bony structures. Uh, whereas uh, MRI uh, is really good for showing soft tissue contrast, such as uh, that uh, in, in, in the brain. Now, another important thing here is that CT is based on X-rays um, uh, and uh, that radiation, X-ray radiation is ionizing radiation, which means that it's harmful for the human body. Whereas uh, MR is non-ionizing radiation, which means it's, it's uh, very safe as long as you don't have metal inside the body. Now let's look at uh, what uh, the field of uh, medical image processing and analysis, you know, can attempt to answer some, some of the some of the questions. Can we improve the images? So uh, when these images are taken, they may contain noise. Now the noise may be uh, uh, sorry, the noise may be um, due to the underlying instrumentation being used, or maybe uh, other factors such as patient motion. So one of the things that we can do is using a uh, these algorithms is to uh, denoise th those images. So the idea is to reconstruct the original image from its noisy observation. And while we want to also preserve important details about um, anatomy, so we want to denoise the image and such that it only removes the noise and we don't want to distort the underlying anatomy. Then another thing that we can um, uh, answer is, can we extract essential information? Uh, so this is also called a segmentation. So segmentation, basically what, it, what these algorithms do is they divide the image in, in regions um, to highlight important areas such as, uh, you know, where is the tumor or um, uh, it automatically goes and highlights the, the region in the image where the tumor is present. Can we assist in uh, diagnosis, um, also called as computer-aided diagnosis, such as divide the image and highlight regions which are cancerous? Can we obtain quantitative measures? Uh, can we develop methods that can uh, tell me, okay, what's the, what's the size or the volume of the tumor? Can we combine information from multiple data sources? So for example, um, I, I talked about MRI and CT and these 
both uh, image kind of images provide uh, different information. So is there a way can we can we fuse the data from these both images and this um, uh, is done through image registration. So what registration does is that it takes um, uh, it, it creates a transform that maps uh, locations from one image to corresponding locations to the other images. Uh, so uh, it's like it's it's kind of um, it takes these both different two coordinate systems and maps it into uh, into one coordinate system. Now, uh, an example over here. This is um, a smart uh, 3D denoiser that was developed in our company. Uh, here is an example of an image with noise, and you can see that um, after the noise removal, uh, we see something like this. So this algorithm is completely automatic, and it leads to um, approximately 600% um, uh, increase in signal to noise ratio. Another example of the denoiser. Here you can see that the image is completely um, useless, you know, you cannot really uh, see the underlying anatomy over here. Whereas after the denoising, um, at least this can be used for uh, further diagnosis. Another example for uh, CTA bone removal. So CTA is computed tomography and geography. Uh, so it's actually a, a CT technique uh, that's used to visualize arteries throughout the, throughout the body. So what happens is that a contrast agent is injected uh, into the blood vessels. And the idea is to look for blockages. Now, in these scans, uh, these arteries are obscured by the bone. So the idea is to develop a method uh, which can actually remove the bone such that these arteries can be visualized. And this technique was uh, developed here. You can see the result over here. So the remaining part of my uh, talk, I will actually um, look at some of the uh, methods, specifically how diffusion imaging uh, is used for, for mapping the, the human brain, how MRI can be used for understanding uh, the progression of osteoarthritis, which is actually uh, a joint disease. We look at um, how computation is helpful uh, for radiation therapy planning. And we look at some applications in Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, sorry. Um, when was the, when did my voice get disrupted? Yeah, was towards it? the end of this slide. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, this is the outline of the, of the, of the presentation. So we're gonna uh, go in, uh, let's start with, uh, with uh, diffusion imaging. So at the heart of, um, the brain nervous system are neurons. So neurons are nerve cells uh, that transmit electrochemical signals. So this is what a neuron looks like. So it's divided in, in two parts, uh, the cell body uh, and the axon. So the uh, cell body, uh, the, uh, it actually integrates information from other neurons, whereas the axon, it actually transmits the information. Now the axon, is uh, surrounded by um, a fatty substance called myelin. Now myelin is, is white in color, while the tissue containing the cell body is colored gray, hence dividing the brain in, in two main parts, the white matter and, and the gray matter. And you may have heard these terms before. Now, these are some of the um, um, white matter uh, tracks, most prominent white matter tracks in, in the brain. We are mostly uh, in this talk, we look at uh, the corticospinal tract, uh, which is actually the largest descending pathway in the human brain. And it's responsible for providing motor functions such as limb movements. So these tracks go through the spinal cord and they connect to the motor cortex of the, of the brain. Any damage to these tracks can actually lead to paralysis. Now, uh, how does diffusion, uh, how can we use diffusion imaging uh, for, uh, for this kind of visualization? 
Uh, but before we look into diffusion imaging, what is diffusion? So imagine that you have a glass of water lying on a table in a, in a, sealed, loo uh, in a sealed room. So that uh, water may seem stationary to you, but at the molecular level, uh, the water molecules are, are moving. Uh, their motion is, is random, and this is also called the Brownian motion. And this is what uh, diffusion imaging aims to quantify. An important property about uh, diffusion in white matter of the brain is that, that it's anisotropic, which means it's direction dependent. So there is faster diffusion along the axons than across it. Now, Peter Vassar in 94 developed um, a mathematical model. So um, what he did was that at each location of the image, uh, uh, of the diffusion image, he, he quantified a tensor. A tensor is a mathematical entity. It's a, uh, in layman terms, it's like a three by three matrix. So he quantified a tensor at each location. And uh, then the tensor is then diagonalized, uh, resulting in, in um, uh, three eigenvectors. So the idea is to use the tensor to map these pathways in the brain. So a single trajectory through the brain is generated by connecting the principal eigenvector of each tensor. So this technique is called tractography. And so what you are, you're essentially doing is that you, you can imagine that your principal eigenvector is like a vector field and you trace the path of a particle in that field. And the track, the generated track over here is a curved tangent tangents to that field. So here's an example of um, uh, tractography being done in the brain. So this over here, you can see the white matter fiber pathways of corpus callosum. Now this is the largest white matter fiber bundle uh, in the brain. And that example, this was work with uh, LJ Donnell at Harvard Medical School. And you can see um, all the um, uh, full, this is a result of full brain tractography. Now, why is this information important or what can be it used for? So this is the uh, image I showed earlier. So these are, uh, this, these are the corticospinal tracts and you can see that they are connecting to different areas of the motor cortex. And this is uh, how with, this, with the current technique, how the um, spinal tracts were visualized based on, on tractography. Now these blobs over here, what do they represent? These are actually fMRI activations. So what happens is that the, the patient is, is given a task such that, you know, move your hand or leg or, or face, uh, you know, the limbs. And then um, uh, the fMRI instrumentation, it goes and it measures the hemodynamic response or changes in blood flow. And then it maps the areas of the brain which are active during the task. So you can, you can then uh, visualize, okay, which areas of the brain were active. So these uh, the, um, this area of the motor cortex is actually reserved for the hand. This area is reserved for the leg. So the whole idea is can, with the standard tractography, we can visualize tracks going to these areas. And I'll, in a minute, show you why is this uh, important. And as you can see, that uh, we know that the tracks should actually go and diverge over here. Uh, so essentially, in this area, you know, there are several tracks and they are uh, crossing each other, whereas with the standard technique that was developed um, early on, it's just not possible. Now, what we did was we developed uh, a technique that can actually go ahead and um, resolve fiber crossings. So this is the standard, this is an image showing uh, uh, the standard technique, and this was a technique that was developed. And here you can see it can resolve all these, all these tracks over here. And again, why is this useful? So example, uh, for example, a neurosurgeon is resecting a tumor in this region. Now they want to know which pathways are uh, present over here. They don't want to go and, and cut the wrong pathway because this could actually lead, lead to paralysis. Another example over here where uh, with the standard technique, you can um, see the pathways around the tumor with the proposed method. Uh, which was developed, you can see uh, many more pathways over here. So uh, if anyone is interested, some further info. Uh, so this method uh, was actually uh, developed as part of the open source uh, toolkit team, uh, which is um, part of 3D Slicer. It's a software platform developed by Harvard Medical School and, and it's a joint collaboration between the surgical planning laboratory at Harvard Medical School and the um, uh, MIT CSAIL 
uh, departments. So this um, is actually a good resource for students who want to pursue, um, you know, further information regarding this field. It's, it's a very good tool. So now let's look at some methods for uh, how MRI uh, is useful for analysis of the articular cartilage. Now osteoarthritis is a very common joint disease. It's degenerative in nature. It affects the lives of more than 200 million people with an estimated burden of about $65 billion. So the prevalence of OA increases with age and currently there is no known uh, cure for OA. The current treatments, they are directed more towards pain relief and OA is generally characterized by degeneration of the cartilage. So what's the cartilage? So this is your lower bone uh, of the knee, which is uh, um, the tibia bone, and this is the femur. Now cartilage is a region in between these two bones. So this is an image of uh, what a bovine cartilage looks like. So as you can see that it's a frictionless gliding surface, and this is what gives the joint its mobility. Now, how, uh, what happens to the cartilage during OA? Let's, let's look at that. So uh, this is a healthy joint and this is a tissue of the cartilage seen under the microscope. Now, as the disease progresses, you can see that the cartilage starts to break down. And during the um, uh, late stages of the disease, the cartilage is completely gone. And then it's just a bone against bone. And this is what uh, leads to pain. Now, the current gold standard for monitoring uh, the progression of osteoarthritis is actually from radiographs or from x-rays. So what radiologists do is that they go ahead and they try to measure the space between the femur and the tibia. And based on the, on the spacing information, they go and um, uh, rate it according to the scale. Now, and, and they call this joint space width. Now, is joint space width an, an optimal measure? Certainly not, because the cartilage is not even visible in, uh, in x-rays. Now, MRI uh, has been gaining a lot of attention in the assessment of the cartilage. Why? It's, be it's because MRI is non-invasive and it allows visualization of the cartilage. So as you can see over here, this is an MR, a knee MR scanner, and you can see uh, this is an MR scan of the knee, and you can see that the cartilage <coughs> is visible over here. And you can develop methods where you can go and create algorithms that can go and automatically segment the, the cartilage, like the one <coughs> shown over here. Now, based on this, based on the segmentation of the cartilage, uh, you can um, um, uh, generate computative methods like cartilage volume and thickness, uh, which can be then used to monitor the progression of osteoarthritis. Now, uh, another image over here showing the um, uh, segmentation of the cartilage. And uh, this was a, a framework that was developed to monitor and find out which areas of the cartilage are most affected by the disease. And uh, it was a statistical. <laughs> so, so what it did was that it went and it um, um, took took a set of da data, a set of, of knees of healthy and uh, patient uh, of healthy uh, knees and um, uh, patients with osteoarthritis, and and it tried to find out which regions in the cartilage are most uh, <laughs> discriminative of the disease. Where does uh, most pathological changes happen? And we found out that most of the um, uh, disease modifying re regions are most towards the exterior of the cartilage. Now, why is this information useful? Uh, this information can be uh, useful for uh, you know, monitoring the disease progression, or most importantly, uh, it can be extremely useful for, for clinical trials. So for example, if you wanna develop a, a drug, you, you want to monitor progression of the disease uh, or the effects of the drug only in regions where it make effect. So you filter out the noisy regions and only look at this region. And, and indeed, this was um, what the method was, was used for. So it was uh, part of a very large uh, uh, clinical trial done by a pharmaceutical company. Uh, so anyone who is more interested in, in uh, learning more about the method, these are some of the, of the resources. Now, let's look at some of the methods that were uh, developed for radiation uh, therapy planning. Now, what is radiation therapy? 
Um, so radiation uh, is, a, is a technique which goes and tries to kill cancer cells. Now radiation itself um, doesn't care about healthy or uh, healthy cells or cancer cells. It's going to go and kill uh, anything in its way. Now, this is not good because while you, when you are giving radiation to a patient, you want to have minimal damage uh, to healthy tissues. Now, with recent advances, uh, advances in radiation therapy, specifically IMRT, which is intensity modulated radiation therapy, you can actually give a precise dose delivery to the tumor with minimal damage to surrounding tissue. So what you intend to do with IMRT is that you give a very high dose of radiation to the tumor and then uh, the radiation to the surrounding tissues is not that high. Uh, but this is only possible uh, if you can actually go ahead and contour all the structures in that particular uh, case. So uh, you, take, you take a CT scan of the, of the region where you wanna give the radiation and then in order to use IMRT, you go and you have to contour all the structures, both healthy and the ones where you have to, uh, and, and uh, where the tumor is. Now this uh, uh, takes a lot of time. So as, um, as an example, an average physician's working time on a single head and neck um, IMRT case is like three hours. So for three hours, he spends for one case and imagine that if that whole uh, method can be automated, then uh, those three hours could be spent uh, seeing uh, new patients. And this is what uh, the whole idea was. It was to develop a fully automated uh, methodology for the head and neck region. Uh, so these are some of the results for the, uh, for the method. Uh, so you can see that these contours over here, uh, this is a um, head and neck CT case, and it's showing you the contours that was done by the physician. They, these are shown in green, where are the contours uh, that were automatically uh, um, delineated by our method are shown in, um, uh, in colored. Now, these are the different regions. Uh, so this is the mandible. This is um, also your lower jaw. These are parotid glands. This is the brainstem, and these are neck nodes. Now, this method was actually uh, developed um, as part of Philips um, platform called Pinnacle. It's a, it's a system for giving radiation therapy, for doing radiation therapy planning. And the method was, uh, was named SPICE. Uh, SPICE. SPICE stands for Smart Probabilistic Image Contouring Engine. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, now in, in routine used. And um, uh, the feedback that I've got is, is really good. Like it's, it's within a matter, imagine that, now that spending three hours, you don't have to spend three hours. In a matter of, matter of minutes, your contours are generated. This is another example of the, of the methodology. And here you can see that um, uh, all these organs were segmented within a met, um, method of minutes. So for some more information, if anyone is, is interested. So now uh, the... Uh, remaining part of my presentation will focus uh, on uh, image analysis primarily for for dental applications. So um, I've been do, um, being uh, developing methods in the dental world now for about ten years. So an, an example is uh, Three Shapes uh, Trios. So uh, Three Shape is a company based in in Denmark, and um, we started development of an intraoral scanner. So an intraoral scanner, what the, what the idea was that um, uh, to enable digital dentistry workflow. So uh, what happens is that when a patient walks in, uh, a dentist actually takes an impression of the teeth to see, you know, if, if the teeth are aligned or, you know, what, let's suppose if the, if the teeth are missing, then they take an impression. Now that impression, they have to go and then scan and, and it's all time consuming and uh, leads to more chair time for the patient. Now, the idea was to develop a scanner where you, you could actually go and directly scan the patient's teeth without taking any impressions. So you um, go ahead and directly scan the teeth and the surrounding soft tissue. This, so this is what was, was developed. I worked only, uh, um, only the, on the first prototype of the, of the system and um, this is what the scanner looks like. So you see um, uh, the dentist actually goes and it scans and it generates a 3D model of the teeth and the surrounding tissue. So here's a video just showing you um, 
the latest version of the scanner, it's, uh, it's a wireless and it's extremely fast. So you can see here, the person is actually scanning his, uh, the lower jaw. And in a matter of seconds, uh, it goes and it um, scans, takes all the images, stitches them. And you see under 11 seconds, the whole lower jaw was scanned. So this, this is what the power of computing is in this, uh, in this field. So for the past uh, almost uh, seven to eight years, I've been involved in the field of image guided surgery. So it's, uh, what is image guided surgery? It's a surgical procedure, uh, which in real time tracks and correlates the position of the surgical tool to preoperative imaging data. Now this surgical procedure can be human driven or could be fully autonomous, such as um, the famous D, uh, Da Vinci robot uh, for laparoscopic surgery. So uh, what do you require for, for such a procedure? So you require a set of imaging data, example, MRI or, or CT data. Uh, then once you have obtained your data, you do a pre-operative planning of the surgery. Like where do you want to make the incision? Or, or uh, where, do you, where, where, is, where is the tumor present? You know? Now, imagine you have these two worlds. You have an imaging data, which I would call a virtual patient. And then you have a real world, where, where, um, which is the surgical world, or, or the real world where the patient is, is lying on the, on the surgical table. Now, you want to map from the virtual patient to the real world, and this is done through registration. There are different techniques, uh, but I'll talk about the technique that was developed uh, for our product. And finally, once you have the registration, you can go ahead and do navigation. Now, navigation would mean that you, you try to uh, track uh, the physician's tools um, and uh, display them in real time onto your imaging data. Now, the system uh, that I'm going to show is actually used for a dental surgery, uh, primarily for placing implants. So what are implants? Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, it's a um, known way to replace missing roots and support artificial teeth. So this is what an implant uh, looks like. Uh, so it's made of metal. Um, titanium uh, is the most commonly used metal and titanium uh, fuses really well with the, with the bone. And once the implant is placed, uh, then an artificial tooth um, called a crown can be mounted on top of it. Presently, 90% of the implants are placed freehand, which means the dentist just goes and blindly drills into the bone. Now, this obviously could lead to patient discomfort and risk of uh, infection. Other than that, you have to go, uh, go and cut, your, uh, cut the gums to expose the, the jaw bone. Uh, you could, since you are drilling blindly, you could potentially damage nearby nerves or the membranes of the maxillary sinus in, in, in the upper jaw. And since you are, you have to cut the gums, you have to go and stitch them up, which extends the surgery healing time. And finally, obviously, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, since you're doing it manually, uh, it leads to human error, such that the ones shown over here. So these were four implants that were placed in a patient, two without Navident, uh, and, and two with Navident. So you can see that the ones without Navident are actually extruding outside the bone. And this actually is not good because it leads to uh, much less aesthetically pleasing restorations. Now, what is Navident? In layman terms, it's a GPS for dentists. So using the three-dimensional cone beam CT as a map, Navident enables real-time visualization of the dental's drill. It provides guidance for position, angulation, and depth of the surgeon's drill. Our system is very accurate. It leads to uh, the system overall end-to-end -end system accuracy is 500 microns. So we started development of the system in 2011 uh, as a, as a two-person team, uh, and the system was was co-developed with uh, with our clinical partner, uh, which is a, U, a UFT dentistry school. Since it's a medical device, you cannot just you know develop it and and start selling it you have to go and do clinical trials and get regulatory approvals. So the device was approved for sale in Europe in 2015, and then it was approved by FDA uh, in 2016 for sale in, in the US. Uh, so when we started uh, the system uh, in 2011, uh, there was no other system like this in the, in the market. Um, 
early on in, in early 2000s, a company, a French company um, developed a similar system. However, it was really very expensive and not accurate. So uh, it, it uh, died out. Um, so now we are, there are a few other systems uh, in the market now, but we are still the global market uh, leader with uh, more than 50% market share. So let's look at the workflow of the system. So uh, the, the whole thing begins with uh, the patient walking in and the first step in the process is that you create a stent. A stent is a piece of thermoplastic which get molded around the patient's teeth. Now with that stent molded, you go ahead and you send the patient uh, to get a scan done. That scan is imported in the, in the software and the uh, dentist goes and plans where he wants to place the implant. And uh, finally, uh, he goes ahead in the uh, surgery room and uh, places them. Now, this is what the workflow shows like. So you start with the scan, you go to plan, which is your virtual patient, uh, your image. And then you, um, using this mapping or registration, you go to the real patient. So this is where the registration comes in. So to register our system, we use something called a fiducial. So we developed this, it's a, it's a piece of metal, aluminum, and um, it has all these features. And um, we spent a lot of time designing and, and testing this. So even uh, in the scanner, so even if you have, uh, you know, three corners of this fiducial um, visible in the scan, still you would be able to successfully and accurately register um, uh, the data. So this is what uh, typical uh, surgeon rooms look like. Uh, so this is our system. Uh, you have a, a optical, uh, um, uh, a stereoscopic camera over here, which goes and it um, tracks these tools. This is the software that's running. Uh, this is our, our Navident card. Now, all development of the system was done in-house. Uh, so we own the camera, uh, the cart, um, obviously the software. The software, uh, we are not using any third-party tools. Everything is developed in-house. So this is a small video which actually um, shows you how the surgery, um, what happens during the Navident surgery. So here um, a patient, the bridge is removed. The first step is actually going and fabricating the stent. So you put it in warm water and mold it around the patient's teeth. You attach the fiducial uh, to, the, to the teeth and then you send them for a um, CT scan. So the patient is then scanned and the data is imported in our software and then the dentist can go ahead and plan the implants. Now, during the surgery, the first step is to calibrate our tools. This is done in real time and is all gesture based. So after the tools are, uh, are calibrated, uh, you know, the, the dentist can go and just start drilling. And while it's drilling, uh, in real time, you're gonna see uh, the patient's, uh, the, the drill onto the patient's teeth. So you can see that while you're drilling, you're looking at the angulation and um, the depth uh, and the positional. And here mm -hmm. the implants are, are placed. Now, this system was, was launched um, uh, in, in the US market in 2016. Uh, so not, not, a, um, you know, not a long time ago, about three years. So we started to, to, um, to see some, some issues, like the, the major complaint that we got was the stent. Uh, so the molding, although in the video, it, it's not very apparent, but it actually adds 15 to 30 minutes to the procedure time. Uh, and uh, the thing is that many uh, dentists, they don't have a CT scanner on site. So they have to uh, send the patient to uh, a, ho a hospital. And making the stent is not easy. The dentist, they don't want to do it. And when the assistants do it, they actually mess things up. So for example, this is a stent molded onto the patient's teeth and you can see the stent is not fitting well, like it's in the air and this would lead to accuracy issues during drilling. So uh, we immediately reacted and uh, we, um, instead, we completely um, developed a new methodology for registration. So this methodology is completely new. Nobody else has a similar uh, technique or technology in the world right now. So what we did there was that instead of using the stent, we uh, said, okay, why, why can't we use the patient as the fiducial? So we call this technology trace in place. So this happens in real time. And what, uh, what the dentist does is that he goes, takes this tool and goes and traces around the patient's teeth. So it's, 
it takes under a, a minute or so to trace the patient's teeth. And then this trace in real time gets registered to the patient's data. So these are some of the examples of the traces being registered to the, to the teeth. Uh, we launched this about one and a half year ago. And so far we have seen a, quite a bit of increase in the sales of our system. Uh, dentists love it. You know, they don't have to go and get a special scan done. They don't have to make the stent. Uh, this, it's fairly easy. And even if it gets messed up, for example, you go and the registration is not accurate, you just go ahead and do it. So you don't have to go and do any rescans. So to uh, summarize this, this talk, um, imaging has uh, become a routine research and clinical tool, uh, specifically uh, computational methods such as um, those for image analysis have become a key component of clinical decision making. So where is the future heading? I see a lot of uh, work um, in this field, research as far as research is concerned, um, in, in artificial intelligence, AI, or more specifically, deep learning. Now, there's a lot of work going on, but is it being directed more towards commercial products? Um, that's no, and, and why is the reason? The reason is that these methods, they require tons and tons of data. Uh, deep learning, like specifically conv uh, convolutional neural networks, they require a lot of data. Now, uh, most of the algorithms that are uh, you know, being researched, they are supervised in nature, which means that with all this data that is available, uh, the physician needs to go and contour these, these data sets. This requires a lot of time, and this is the time that they don't have. So, uh, and which actually ends up that these methods, they don't have a lot of data. Now, uh, another problem is regulatory limitations. So any algorithm that you develop actually needs approval. You can't just develop a method and, and go and go and release it. It needs to be uh, accepted uh, by FDA or, or European authorities. Now, FDA has been very conservative about um, um, approving uh, deep learning systems. And even if they do, they accept the systems to be uh, in the locked state, which means that the, those systems cannot go and adapt themselves to new data. And if they have to retrain their methods to new data, they have to go ahead uh, and apply for another approval. Um, will these things change over time? Time will tell. So um, now uh, we looked at, um, obviously at the field of image guided surgery and how it's uh, re revolutionizing um, uh, surgery. And I guess industry is, is moving towards fully autonomous systems such as uh, robotic surgery. And this is something we are also looking at in our company. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, if you have any questions, comments, uh, feel free to drop me an email. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kazi. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, it was definitely a very informative session. I would be shortly opening the floor for questions to all the participants. But before I do that, I have a quick question. Uh, since I was also listening uh, to the entire session and it was, you know, a very insightful session for me as well. But uh, uh, so obviously uh, you're a PhD doctor and it's a very specialized field. So can you talk a little bit about how you started at FOSP? Uh, probably you were there for a bachelor's and how was your career progression from from as a FAS student doing a bachelor's and you know over all these year, years building up to this very specialized field so you know, if yeah. you can for for the existing and current students if you can talk a little bit about that uh, career path or the track uh, that you took uh, that eventually led you to over here because this is not a very you know, uh, not a common field. It's a very specialized one. Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, during my uh, degree in FAST, um, so I, I'm, I'm 99 batch graduating in, in 2002. Um, FAST Islamabad. FAST Islamabad, right. Um, so my, my final year project was actually related to image processing and um, um, it was obviously 2D image processing, but that's where it all uh, began. So my final year project was related to uh, using iris recognition for uh, biometric authentication. 
And that's where my interest in, in image processing started. And, um, but medical imaging came, came a bit later. Uh, so when I moved on for my master's, um, that's where I um, actually got an opportunity to work for Philips Medical Systems in, in Germany and as, a, as an engineer. And there, that's where, you know, since I had a background already in, in image processing, um, I actually could um, go and um, I was able to get the, get that um, uh, position, and um, that's where that's where it all started. Now, as far as the as the as the um, undergrad or even at the graduate level, these courses are concerned in terms of uh, you know the field of medical imaging. I do understand that in 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 Pakistan, it's not very common, and you see the reason is because first of all industry is not very active over there and secondly what is uh, the reason what drives all these methodologies is the healthcare now in hospitals in in pakistan obviously you have a lot of data but um, the physicians over there are not really interested to um, you know provide the data to the institutions or even uh, help them doing this research so that's why things are are really uh, lacking over there but um, yeah, my, my primary, like, obviously all this didn't really um, start back in Pakistan, but my, to answer your question, my basic, um, the reason why I, I went into this field is because of, of my interest um, to image processing and my and FIP. Your final year project, correct? And my okay. final year project, right. Okay, that's good. Uh, we just got a question uh, from one of the participants and uh, the question is how can your organization collaborate with various professors in Pakistan that are in the field of image processing. Is there a scope for joint venture with organizations in Pakistan? Uh, yeah, that's my organization is actually a private company and we are not really, um, you know, actively collaborating outside uh, the company. So from that respect, um, there is no such, um, you know, collab even even our, our collaboration here is very limited. So to answer your question, uh, you know, it's but but I am available. Like I, uh, some uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, he actually now is uh, a professor in um, in an institution uh, in Islamabad, and uh, you know, routinely off and on, I do get to um, uh, let's say um, collaborate with some of his his students who have an interest in image processing and medical imaging. So. Uh, last year, I, I um, was an external supervisor for a PhD dissertation. So in that way, I'm doing it on my, on my, uh, you know, in, on an individual basis. But from, from my company's perspective, uh, you know, they're, they're not interested. So. Uh, okay. Uh, and then one question, another question from my side is how easy or difficult was it to, you know, learn all the medical jargons because, uh, you were uh, and you are still a computer scientist or a or an engineer, but uh, from your presentation, it looks like you're half medical doctor as well now, <laughs> or a dentist. Yeah. So, how easy or difficult was to you know learn all those stuff? Um, honestly, it it wasn't it wasn't very difficult. Like it just I, I just read books and uh, like you have to do a lot of reading. Obviously, there's I mean, there's no way, there's no shortcut there. So you have to read books, you have to, you know, understand the anatomy and understand from, you know, uh, look at a lot of images, ask a lot of questions. So that's what I did, I guess. Okay, uh, good. Um, we have some more questions. We have Mr. Ahmed Malik online. Uh, uh, Mr. Malik, would you like to have, would you like to ask any question? Um, um, you basically you asked the questions that uh, I had in mind uh, about his journey uh, and uh, um, I also heard a great deal about how this business knowledge is important uh, uh, to learn uh, along with the field of computer science to help so you, you've asked uh, both of my questions there um, I uh, anything any advice you would have for us uh, or the students to work with uh, perhaps medical students in Pakistan to tell them how their work could uh, help uh, eventually uh, the 
the universities there? I mean, I think, is there an opportunity for medical students and computer sciences students to collaborate to do some joint final year projects uh, that would be benefit, uh, beneficial for both the industries? Yes, definitely. I mean, there is a lot of potential. As you can see, you know, how automation can actually reduce um, the burden. And, you know, especially in Pakistan, where the number of patients uh, significantly outnumber the number of physicians available. So I think there is a lot of potential over there. Now, uh, obviously, this happens, this needs to happen both at the institution level and at the other institution, which is your hospital. Uh, so um, I guess it should start at the, at the professor, you know, whoever is, is, um, is, is interested or, uh, in this, then, then they should go and, uh, they can present a case study to the, to the hospitals and see if they are interested. But you see, um, from what, from what my experience have been initially is that, um, the level of motivation in terms of the institution is high, but the level of motivation in terms of uh, the institution, the healthcare institution involved is not that high. And, and, and it's not, it's not, um, I guess it, it's, it's primarily because of the burden. Uh, there, there are so many patients and, you know, they don't have time to go ahead and do contouring. You know, it, it requires doing this requires a lot of involvement from the, from the clinician. So um, it's, 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 uh, it's a tough, tough thing to do. Um, but, but I guess if, if somebody presents a very, um, uh, you know, good case about, they can, they can, you know, from, so even if the clinician's um, involvement is not that uh, much, still, I guess, at the, at the inst educational institution level, the professor himself can, can, you know, be more motivated and maybe um, help, the, help the clinician. So, so I guess in that respect, um, the idea is to, you know, you could, you could go in and, uh, for example, the professor can go uh, to the to the institution, you know, to to hospital and and see where most of the imaging is being done, and then uh, see what kind of problems they have and start small. You know, they don't have to go and develop a whole product, so they can start small. They can, you know, help them with delineation or help them with with you know, let's say if they're looking at radiographs, so they can make a very small software. Um, uh, and which can actually go and just mark some locations on the image. So I guess they, they could be done a lot, but um, it, it really, you need, you need uh, uh, involvement from, from both sides. So I hope yeah. I hope Yeah, I, I do think, uh, uh, thanks for the answer. Uh, I, I think there is an opportunity between the students at the computer science institute oh. like BAST or others to work with the students in the medical field to start changing the mindset so that eventually when those other students go into the industry, they bring in the progressive thought process and for the progressive mindset so that eventually those students becoming doctors would start to collaborate with, uh, uh, with the universities of students and other computer science institutes uh, to, to start that industry and academic partnership. Right. Uh, I have another question from one of the participants. Thank you for answering my question. Welcome, Ahmed. Thank you. I have one more question uh, from one of uh, the other participants, uh, Mr. Sayyid Shehriyar. He has actually asked two questions. First one is, how much is it necessary to have a medical background to work within this field? And then the second question is, uh, for a beginner to start working in this field, what are the factors they need to focus on? Uh, so I think probably at the bachelor's level, so what, what factors they need to focus on? Right, um, yeah, you don't, you don't really need any medical background. Like I, I didn't even take um, uh, biology uh, during my O-levels. So, so you, you really don't need any, any medical background. So when you, when you, when you get into this, you, you start reading books and, and it'll, it'll all come to you. Now, as far as undergrad um, is concerned and this field, your, your, your math needs to be really strong. So, so courses like linear algebra or numerical methods, you need to be really good at those because those become the foundation of what I'm doing right now. <coughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, is there anybody else with a question that he would like to ask? Uh, you all guys are unmuted right now, so you can ask a question live as well.
Okay, so looks like uh, I think that's pretty much it from the Q and A side. Uh, you guys can see Dr. Kazi's email uh, address towards uh, on the last slide. So if you have any question, you can reach out directly to him as well. Uh, with that being said, I think we would be um, ending this session. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Kazi, for your time, for taking our time on a weekend. Uh, and I hope this was an insightful session for all the participants as well. And thank you to all of you as well for joining in. And hopefully uh, we'll meet again uh, in the next session uh, with, with another interesting topic. So thank you all. Uh, have a nice rest of your day. Thank you so much, Rufana. And thank you, Zair and Ahmed. Bye. All right. Thank you.